Holy Spirit, as we draw near to you, we invite you into this place this morning. Father God, you are on the move. You are moving in each of our lives. You are moving here in our church family. And as we take every step towards you, Father God, help us to keep our eyes pointed right at you. With the things that you are doing, with the things that you are moving, help us to be open and moving in step and in rhythm with your spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you, worship team. Well, good morning. Again, I'm glad to see everybody here this morning. We are in week two of our um, series of Rediscovering Church 2.0. And last week we uh, were able to see what was going on with Peter as he got rescued out of an exciting uh, adventure in prison. He escaped with an angel and seemed like kind of like a, almost like watching, watching a spy movie happen and, and, and helping him get out. It was incredible, but it had the Holy Spirit moving through the whole thing, and it was wonderful. So today, we are going to talk about God will have the glory, and we're going to see what happens with old King Herod and what's going on in his life this morning. So if you will, we're still in chapter 12 of, uh, we're going to be in chapter 12 of uh, Acts, but we're going to start in a strange place for this. We're going to start at Psalm 46, verse 10. So if you will, hold your spot at Acts and just flip over. You don't have to flip over here if you don't want to. I'll, I'll read it to you. But um, in Acts, or Acts, Psalm 46.10, it has something to say about God getting the glory. And it says this, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Now, a lot of times we love that verse of just reading the first line. Be still and know that I am God. And there is so much power packed in that one verse, but it goes on to remind us who gets the glory. Be still, know that he is God, but God says, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted among the earth. Not man, not me, not you, but God himself. And we can also look at Exodus chapter 20 as well. And first, uh, actually, I think a couple verses there. Or no, verse 3. This is the first commandment. He says, well, actually, even in the very beginning of it, he says, I am the Lord your God. God identifies himself as your God. And he's talking to the Israelites. I am going to be your God. I'm going to be your leader. I'm going to be your sovereign. He also wants to have a relationship with his people. So it's okay to say that God wants to be our friend as long as we don't lose the potency and the importance of his majesty. He also does want to be our friend. But he says, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me connecting to, I will be exalted among the nations and among the earth. I will be, for you shall not make for yourselves carved images. For I, the Lord, I am the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now why would God be jealous? Because He wants us so bad. He wants us to be in relationship 
with Him. Not with an idol, not with something that man made or you know, something I'm not going to go out and worship this little card here or a piece of paper or some... Um, uh, uh, I'm not, he doesn't want me to worship this hand sanitizer. He wants me to worship Him. And so he says, I'm a jealous God. Do not make any images of anything in heaven or on earth. And do not worship those things because I'm a jealous God. Because I want, it's like God wants us all to Himself. And that's a very special thing because it's the kind of love that I would, I would argue, at least in, in my mind, what a parent would be for, for their children. I want you guys to be, you are our family. You are in our family and you're always going to be our family. And we're going to love you so much that we don't want anything to come between us and you, you and I. So keep those ideas in mind as we jump into Acts chapter 12. Because we're going to talk about why God will have the glory. God will have the glory. So our first idea, our first point is going to be exalting ourselves. Do you ever wonder why God tells us not to do this? If we get ourselves all puffed up, we begin to believe that we can take on this world all on our own. We can pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We've got the power. We can do it. We begin to believe we can be like God. And I don't mean it in the way that I want to be more like Jesus and act like Him and love the way He does, but I want to be more like God in the way like Genesis chapter 3 kind of, you can be like God. Just take a bite of the fruit. You know, as Satan whispers those lies into our heads, that's the kind of arrogance that, that comes from that. We have a lot of superstars out there that love to exalt themselves. Don't we? we things bring, this brings out a very human trait. This is a human trait, but it's a very real sin. It is the sin that you cannot, you cannot stand to see in other people because you'll criticize them for it because you, you see that how negative of an impact that it makes. That sin which you most dislike in someone else is what you struggle with inside yourself the most. Does that make sense? The thing that drives you nuts about somebody else is probably the very thing that you're wrestling with yourself. And that sin, and this is coming from C.S. Lewis, that sin that he's talking about is pride. We all wrestle with pride on one level or another. Maybe, maybe some less than others, others more than other people. But C.S. Lewis described this as pride. In Mere Christianity, he describes pride as the absolute anti-God state of mind. It is how the devil became the devil. He wanted to exalt himself. He wanted the glory. He wanted to take the throne from God. And that is exactly how Lucifer, being the most beautiful angel there was, became Satan and was banished from heaven because he came in with pride and arrogance. And instead of looking to worship God, he wanted to be the one being worshipped. Do you see that in people today? Like some of our athletes, some of our musicians, some of our actors and actresses. And I'm not just picking on them, but I mean, the, 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 they are out there and they, they put themselves out there. You could even pick on pastors. Being up in front of people. Whoops, what did I do? I broke something. All right, so we, we, you know, we have to be careful of that too, of not exalting ourselves. And that's why I challenge people. If you feel like I'm not teaching something that is uh, exalting God and exalting His Word, challenge me on that. You should challenge me on that. Because if I'm not teaching something biblical and trying to puff myself up, 
then I need to be accountable just as much as all of you. Right? Because we're all in this together. Because it's so easy to get filled up with pride. And that's the thing that destroys us the quickest. In fact, Lewis even argues that pride, every other sin that we wrestle with, has a root, is rooted in pride. It all comes back to that eventually. So, but in the end, God will have the glory. And no one can take this from God. No one can take the glory from God. They, we can try all we want, but He will not have the glory taken away from Him. So let's actually get into our verse in uh, chapter 12 here. Acts chapter 12, starting in verse 20, and we'll just go to 23 for the moment. And it says, Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace, because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of a god, and not a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. What an end to King Herod. So, point number two, when we try to steal the glory. At this point, you might be wondering, what does all of this do? have to do with our study in Rediscovering Church? What does this have to do with the story of the church and how it was growing? This has everything to do with how the church grows because Luke uses this example of Herod of what kind of leadership not to follow. So let's look at Herod for a second. He is dealing with a conflict with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They are seeking peace with Herod because Judea is where they all get their food supplies. So they need to be in good relationship with Herod. So they're trying to make peace with him because they know he's upset with them at that time about something. And so they, they're trying to reconcile that to, so that they still have a food supply. So basically, Herod was the owner of Walmart, the Myers, the Costco, and all these all at the same time, to put it in modern day terms. And so he, and he, run, he ran all the food, he, he had their food source. And so they had to have good relationship with him. So they were playing right into Herod's hand. Now, how does Herod respond to this? He puts on his best robes dresses to the nines. He has his lavish royal throne brought out for him to sit on. Then he offers a grand oration, as he put it, or speech to delight their ears with. And how do the people respond? How do they respond? This is a God, a voice of a God. Then, Herod, what does he do? He just revels in it. He's like, yeah. Yeah. I'm not. He doesn't stop him from staying there. He doesn't say, no, 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 no. I am not a god. I'm merely a human. I'm just a man. I'm still, I'm your king, but I'm, the glory needs to go to God. No, what does Herod do? He's just eating it right up, isn't he? Here, let me sign your autograph. You, you know, I mean, it's, he's, he's loving it. God doesn't give him a whole lot of time to fix this error, though, does he? Immediately, God responds, and an angel of the Lord strikes him down. Why? He was not giving God the glory. I'm glad that God does not always respond that way. Aren't you? 
He does respond that way, and there's always a consequence when we don't give Him the glory. How many times have we accomplished something and taken the glory for it? How many times? Way too often, right? I remember, in fact, I forgot to bring them out with me, but uh, my boys loved to get into my old medals from high school, and I won all these medals and stuff uh, for weightlifting, and I was, I was big into powerlifting, and I would go to the, we'd have competitions and would win these medals, and, the, and my boys, they love to get into them, like, oh, Dad, can I have one of these? I'm like, oh, maybe, you know, I said, sure, I said, go ahead, here, have one and play. Of course, they lose them, you know. But, they're, but if you think about it, I've got them stored away in a box, sitting in my office, and collecting dust. It's just a piece of metal. And it wasn't me. It wasn't just because, I mean, I was strong, and I could lift a lot of weight. And, I was, and of course, when I was in high school, I was like, yeah, you know. Felt real proud of myself for what I did. And there's nothing wrong with being a, proud of your accomplishments. But who is it that gave me the strength to lift those weights? Who is it that gives us the ability to do the things that we can do? Whether it's singing, whether it's speaking, whether it's praying. Of course, I, don't, I, don't, I think everybody can pray. It doesn't matter. how. There's no good or bad about praying. But, you know, everybody's given different gifts. Maybe it's if you signed up for the welcome team. Maybe your gift is greeting people and making them feel welcome in church. Maybe your gift is teaching and you love, and, and you love to teach children. You know what I'm saying? So God gives us all these different gifts, but it's Him who should get the glory. And so, going back to our famous people. On the other hand, we have people who do give God the glory. People I can think of right off the bat is Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow was giving God the glory so much he got kicked out of the NFL. Patrick Mahomes, who just won the Super Bowl last week, he's a Christian. He's, he's open about his faith. He's open about what God's doing in his life. And God gave him the talent to be a quarterback, to play in the NFL. One of the youngest quarterbacks now in NFL history to win the both the... Uh, I'm going to blow it because I can't remember which division he's in. So football fans can help me out. Is it AFC? All right, I got it. So one of the youngest quarterbacks in NFL history to win the AFC championship and one of the youngest quarterbacks to win the Super Bowl and, or be the MVP. He was considered the MVP. And if you kept up with that, the last four games, he won, they won those games from coming from behind and from a, quite a deficit in a couple of those games. And even though I was rooting against him, I really wanted the 49ers to win. God blessed him with that. He blessed those men with those talents to be where they're at. And, they gave, and a lot of them gave God the glory. Another professional athlete that I think about from the past is Reggie White. Reggie White was a huge, humongous man. He played for both the Green Bay Packers and the uh, Jets. Or was it the Eagles? I think it was the Eagles. Anyway, he was a big lineman, and he, he actually became a pastor. And so not only was he a professional football player, but he was also a pastor. At a church. I don't know how he pulled that off, but it, it's amazing. Sorry, I still have football on the brain. I haven't gotten over it yet. I'm gonna, it's going to be sad until, no, I'm kidding, until the fall. But, um, but in Herod's case, God will have the glory. Whether he wanted to give God the glory or not, he was going to get the glory. And he took Herod out because he wasn't giving him the glory. He was taking it in for himself. So, how do we kill our pride? That's our third point. Killing our pride. And we're going to look at Matthew uh, 23, verse 12. Because we want to see, I want to see what Jesus has to say about this. And he says this, 
in Matthew 23, 12, he says, whoever humbles himself will be exalted, but whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Okay? God is going to have the glory. And Jesus is telling us, you need to humble yourself before God. This happened, something happened to another king in the past. Let's look at Daniel chapter 4. This guy has got a funny name too. His name is Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar is warned about his pride in taking the glory. And I'm going to read a little bit of the story. It says, and this is in, starting in verse 28, Daniel chapter 4, verse 28. All this came upon Neb King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? While the words were still on the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. That's a key point right there. God will give kingdoms to whom he will. So that means he puts people in leadership to whom he wills it. No matter who we like or dislike. He was, now, King Nebuchadnezzar was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers, and his nails were like bird's claws. Kind of kind of strange, isn't that? This is how God responded to King Nebuchadnezzar's pride. At the end of the days, I, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's actually talking, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and He does according to His will among the hosts of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay in his hand and say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my lords sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me, but now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of Heaven, for all His works are right and His ways are just. And those who walk in pride, He is able to humble. So again, God will have the glory. Well, how does that work for us? I have a few quotes here that I found online about humility. St. Augustine, I got a couple from him that says, Humility is the foundation of all the other virtues hence. In the soul in which this virtue does not exist, there cannot be any other virtue except in mere appearance. Humble yourselves before God. St. Augustine. He also said, there is something in humility which strangely exalts the heart. Which goes right back to what Jesus said. He who humbles himself will be exalted. But if you exalt yourself, God will humble you. And I'm sure most of us have been able to experience it at one time or another firsthand. 
Because he will put us in our place when we get out of when we get out of step. Another one. I found one from Tim Tebow. So much of how we act and what we do is based on humility or pride. That's everything. And when you can humble yourself, you know we are more like Christ when we can humble ourselves. Isn't that what Jesus did when he came into this world? He said, I didn't come here to be built up and, 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 and lifted up. He says, I came here to humble myself and to be more like a servant. And that's what we need as leaders. We've got to be more like servants. I have to look at myself in the mirror and tell me myself that all the time. Be more like a servant. Makes me think of that song, Make Me a Servant. Humble and meek. Got to kill that pride. C.S. Lewis said, True humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. I like that one. True humility is not thinking less. So that means don't go, oh, I'm so horrible and I stink and I just, I'm no good at anything and everybody's better than me. And I'm not. It's not feeling sorry for yourself. In fact, it's not even thinking of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. So that means you're, what does that mean though? That means you're thinking of others more. Right? I see a lot of that in this church. I do. I see a lot of people thinking of others more than they think of themselves. And we need to keep doing that. We need to keep living that. John Piper says, one way to appreciate C.S. Lewis is to see how his Christian humility shaped his life and work. And I put that one up there too because Lewis was a great example of humility. He never he wrote all these great, fantastic books. He wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. He wrote Mere Christianity, the Screw Tape Letters, all these wonderful books on theology. But he lived, if you've seen the house that he lived in, he lived in a very humble house. It was he didn't have these great big mansion or anything like that lived out in the country. He didn't even know how to drive a car. So he was either walking it or he was taking a bus or having somebody drive him somebody, somewhere. I mean, he, this guy really lived a humble life and yet he was like an, known as an Oxford Don. And, but he lived in such humility. And, and yet he was probably, in the, at least in the 20th century, and I think even now, I mean, people still are impacted by the work that God did through him. So we kill our pride by what? Taking our eyes off of ourselves and putting our focus on Jesus, the one who saves us or saved us if you've already given your life to him. And giving him the credit and the praise for everything we have because in the end, God will have the glory. Amen? Amen. Lord Jesus, everything we do, help us to give you the glory. Help us to give you the honor. Help us to give you the praise. And as we come to sing our closing song today, Father, we want to glorify you. We want to honor you and praise you with everything that we do. We pray this for our church family and for everybody we come in contact with. In Jesus' name, amen. If your heart was touched by this this morning, by God's word, not mine, um, and you haven't given your life to Christ yet, I'll be at the back here if you want to talk to me about that. I'd love to just connect with you and uh, talk with you about that and pray with you. Um, otherwise, if you will please stand if you're able. And uh, we're going to sing, Jesus Loves Me.
We give you the praise. And we pray the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen.